It's July 4th, 1976, and for the first time in over 110 years, the city of Vicksburg is celebrating the independence of the United States. But how did it get that way? How did the US city refuse to celebrate the most important American holiday for more than a century? Well, as you probably already know, Mississippi seceded from the Union in 1861 and joined the Confederate States of America. However, the prominent city of Vicksburg actually was fairly loyal to the Union, as their two delegates had actually voted against Mississippi secession. But those facts actually raise more questions than they answer, so let's take a closer look at the city of Vicksburg. Vicksburg was actually a pretty unique place in the south. While agriculture dominated most of the southern economy, Vicksburg, situated on the Mississippi River, brought in a wide variety of commerce, not to mention ideas and beliefs, making it a much more diverse area to other southern places. When the Civil War began, some pro-Union residents fled Vicksburg, fearing that they would get caught in a crossfire during a military campaign, but many simply couldn't escape and had to stay in the city. Those who stayed would soon face the harsh reality of warfare, as Vicksburg soon became a major target for both the Union and the Confederacy. So why was Vicksburg so sought after? Well, throughout the war, the South heavily relied on one of their most critical rivers, the Mississippi, for trade, communication, and military movements. Since Vicksburg was in such a strategic position on this important river, both the Union and Confederacy sought to control the city. Confederate President Jefferson Davis stated Vicksburg was the nailhead that holds the South to have together. While Union President Abraham Lincoln stated, see what a lot of land these fellows hold, of which Vicksburg is the key. The war can never be brought to a close until that key is in our pocket. Real quick, I just want to make the announcement that I have created an online store where you can buy numerous history-themed merchandise, including a dozen of the most famous Civil War battles and sieges, including the Siege of Vicksburg. Go check it out at imperial-history.com or use the link in the description. In 1863, after securing many of the strongholds along the Mississippi River, General Grant began his campaign to take the vital city of Vicksburg. His plan was to march the Union Army down the west side of the Mississippi, cross the river south of Vicksburg, and attack. But in order to get his army across the river, Grant needed the help of the Navy and his generals. In order to divert attention away from his landings, he sent General Sherman north of Vicksburg and Colonel Gerson to central Mississippi, while Rear Admiral David Dixon Porter came down the Mississippi and met up with Grant in Louisiana. Grant and Porter transferred 24,000 men and 60 guns across the river. Due to the Union distraction, the Confederates were now displaced all over Mississippi, all while the rest of Grant's army turned towards Mississippi State Capitol, Jackson. The Confederates now had two forces in the area, one with about 5,000 men at Jackson and about 26,000 men at Vicksburg. Grant's troops defeated General John Gregg near Jackson, causing him to retreat. With Jackson all but lost, General Joseph E. Johnston ordered an evacuation of the city. With the city of Jackson lost, and Vicksburg being the next target, General Pemberton decided his only course of action was to sever Grant's supply line. So Pemberton left about 9,000 men to garrison Vicksburg, while he marched with about 20,000 troops to search for the Union supply line. However, while trying to connect with General Joseph Johnston, his force encountered Grant marching westward, resulting in the Battle of Champions Hill. Pemberton's forces simply couldn't withstand the Union's numbers, causing them to retreat back to Vicksburg. With Vicksburg finally trapped, with very little prospect of reinforcements, Grant began to order numerous bloody assaults on the city. But Vicksburg's large guns that were situated high above made it nearly impossible for any Union troops to get near the Confederate defenses. Thousands of casualties from the strong Confederate defenses left Grant with only one option a siege. Grant's force, now about 77,000 men, began to construct over 15 miles of zigzagging trenches that steadily brought them closer to the Confederate positions. For weeks, the soldiers and civilians endured severe conditions. Grant's artillery pummeled the city day and night while everyone inside starved. Many civilians could only bear the carnage by hiding in man-made caves and eating anything they could find, which often was only cats, dogs, horses, and even rats. And as you can imagine, many became very sick. To give more details about the extreme situation many people were in, here are some quotes from eyewitness and resident Mary Longborough, whose diary of the siege was later published as a book titled My Cave Life in Vicksburg. In the evening, we were terrified and much excited by the loud rush and scream of mortar shells. We ran to the small cave near the house and were in it during the night. By this time, wearied and almost stupefied by the loss of sleep, the eaves were plainly becoming a necessity, as some persons had been killed on the street by fragments of shells. The room that I had so lately slept in had been struck by a fragment of a shell during 
the first night, and a large hole made in the ceiling. I shall never forget my extreme fear during the night, and my utter hopelessness of ever seeing the morning light. Terror stricken, we remained crouched in the cave, while shell after shell followed each other in quick succession. I endeavored by constant prayer to prepare myself for the sudden death I was almost certain awaited me. My heart stood still as we would hear reports from the guns, and the rushing and fearful sound of the shell as it came toward us. As it neared, the noise became more deafening. The air was full of the rushing sound. Pain started through my temples. My ears were full of confusing noise. And as it exploded, the report flashed through my head like an electric shock, leaving me in a quiet state of terror and most painful that I can imagine cowering in a corner. Holding my child to my heart, the only feeling of my life was the choking throbs of my heart that rendered me almost breathless. Sitting in the cave one evening, I heard the most heart-trending screams and moans. I was told that a mother had taken a child into a cave about a hundred yards from us, and having laid it on its little bed as the poor woman believed in safety, she took her seat near the entrance of the cave. A mortar shell came rushing through the air and fell with much force, entering the earth above the sleeping child, cutting through into the cave. Oh, most horrible sight to the young mother, crushing in the upper part of the little sleeping head, and taking away the young innocent wife without a look or word of passing love to be treasured in the mother's heart. On July 1st, General Pemberton and his commanders discussed the prospect of being relieved or fighting their way out, but they eventually came to the conclusion that their situation was futile. Two days later, General Grant and General Pemberton met in the afternoon to discuss surrender. Unconditional surrender Grant, as you might have guessed, demanded unconditional surrender, but he actually allowed the 30,000 Confederates in Vicksburg to be paroled rather than imprisoned. At 10 a.m. on July 4th, Independence Day, General Pemberton officially surrendered his men and the city, as the men who bravely defended the city began to march out, stack their rifles, and fold their flags. The entire campaign since March 29th claimed 10,142 Union casualties to the Confederates 9,091, plus the about 29,000 that surrendered in Vicksburg. However, that was not the end of the suffering for the Vicksburg civilians, as the city would soon surrender as an important military base for the Union. About 5,000 colored troops patrolled the streets and manned the defenses. While Vicksburg's white citizens' rights were suspended, many even had to take loyalty oaths or face arrest or banishment. Due to the defiance many Vicksburg residents had, General McPherson had to issue General Order No. 52 on December 27th decreeing that any individual who insulted or showed disrespect for the president, government, or flag of the United States, or toward any officer or soldier, would be subject to fine, imprisonment, or banishment. So you see, because of the horrific conditions the civilian population had to endure during the siege and the subsequent military occupation afterwards, many had extreme grudges towards the federal government. And since it ended on July 4th, Independence Day, many did not feel like it was a day of celebration. So for about a century, Independence Day celebrations were irregular. The Vicksburg Evening Post in 1883 called July 4th the day we don't celebrate. It wasn't until the U.S. victory in World War II when celebrations became more widespread, especially due to the appearance of World War II hero General Dwight D. Eisenhower, who took part in Vicksburg's 4th of July festivities in 1947. However, the holiday was not recognized as Independence Day and was instead named the Carnival of the Confederacy, though it would officially be called Independence Day once again in 1976 for the 200th birthday of the United States.